Hello, welcome to Graphic Online TV. Ghana's food system faces significant challenges, including food insecurity, inefficiencies in food production and distribution, environmental degradation, and the impact of climate change. Addressing these challenges requires a comprehensive and collaborative approach that leverages the strengths of various stakeholders. I have here with me the country director for World Food Program Ghana. Miss Barbara Clemens and I am Elizabeth Nyedu Edu, a graphic business news reporter. So today we are discussing World Food Program's approach to transform Ghana's food security. Welcome, Miss Barbara. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for having me this morning. Can you please give an overview of your partnership models to contribute to Ghana's food security? Well, first I will. Um, again, thank you for having me on. World Food Program has been present in Ghana over 30 years, almost uh, 40 years. And during that journey, we have um, positioned ourselves to address food security, food insecurity in the form of uh, humanitarian assistance. And we have graduated from um, humanitarian assistance because Ghana has grown from that to now a, a development um, powerhouse in West Africa. So with that growth, we must reposition ourselves to be able to work um, to assist the government in their goals. First and foremost, we are here in Ghana at the behest of the government of Ghana. Um, their ambition for 2030, the SDG goals, um, against that backdrop, we, it's, um, the government has a Ghana Beyond Aid yeah. um, aspiration where their pillars are um, to do things um, differently in order to achieve those goals, addressing wealth, inclusion, um, empowerment, resilience, and sustainability. For the one of the first times what the UN is complementing that with is sustainable development cooperation framework that has three pillars. Um, the first pillar is um, transformation, economic transformation. The second is um, for everyone to have an, an inclusive or equitable access to social um, protection. And the other is sustainable peace. Against that backdrop, we have WFP Country Strategic Plan, which aligns with what the government um, aspirations are and also what the UN at, la at large. Um, front and center are our ownership of the um, Zero Hunger SDG, which is SDG 2. And inherent, we recognize that we are but one agency in a sea of other agencies. We look to leverage our comparative advantages of food systems. And we also look to leverage the comparative advantages of other UN agencies and partners, where we play a convening role in bringing about um, these partnerships to assist the government to achieve its aspiration, either by identifying gaps um, or overlaps and seeing how we can best work within the context of Ghana to close those gaps or eliminate those overlaps. Okay, so from, from what you've said, what are some key enabling rules you are playing to help government um, address our food security? Mm -hmm. Well, with the, under our, our country strategic plan, we have five pillars. The first one is um, our pillar one, which deals with emergency um, preparedness and response. We know the issue, the climatic changes that are going on, which could in and of itself um, hinder or, or strengthen or weaken the food systems in Ghana. The second is nutrition, and we know that whether we have enough food or we don't, if food is not utilized as it should, it tends to erode yeah. the nutrition security of those who are consuming. 
And then we have our food system pillar, which is the third pillar. There's a recognition there that we should not just focus on the production of food, but the entire value chain of the food systems and how can we help uh, to strengthen that. And then we have our SO4, um, which deals with social protection, recognizing that people often don't have equal access to food because they can't afford it. And as such, how can we play an enabling role to ensure that the right amount of food or the right benefit, as we like to call it, is received by the right people at the right time, always. Our focus under this particular pillar are the most vulnerable of uh, societies, our students who must get school feeding, people on the LEAP um, program um, to ensure that there is a, first of all, identifying a bottom line whereby which no one slips through the cracks. We can have no regrets that we have helped those people. So for us, we look at the entire system within Ghana and we are focusing on who are most vulnerable. We're also focusing on who are best prepared to assist us to address some of, um, some of the gaps in our, our food systems. And I think what I'm most proud of, the work that WFP has done in Ghana, is that it's a recognition that we need to work with the government and that we collectively are responsible, the private sector, yeah the civil society, our other partners, in really bringing about a change. We are all responsible. We can't just leave this at the doorsteps of the, of the government, and I think that's key. Yeah. So how, how would this um, development help bring down Ghana's inflation? We know food is very expensive in mm -hmm. some parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from where you sit, how will your role help bring down Inflation. Well, I don't know if WFP solely can help bring that efforts, can help bring down <laughs> with your Ghana. partnership yes. with private yes. sector and the government. But I, what is key is, um, and, and it's not just Ghana, it's all over yeah. um, Africa. And I think it's a, it is a sign of our, um, our economic health, the wealth. And I think it's also a status that we collectively have become extremely dependent on foreign inputs. And um, insofar as WFP encourages front and center the work that we do with food systems are the smallholder farmers. And farmers do produce, but we have to create an enabling environment across the agricultural value chain that when they produce and they produce well, that we prioritize the intake of farmers. That is key. And so we have to, we assist in partnerships in striking a right balance to ensure that if farmers are producing, first of all, that, that we layer in some sustainability, but we also encourage partnerships to uptake what farmers are producing. Um, no matter how well you do, there will come a a time where you people are not buying from you, your goods are not getting to market, or you are having a, a post-harvest losses. How can we reduce, assist in reducing those things that would not incentivize farmers to continue to produce? And I think that's key. Yeah, yeah. and um, we need to consider. Um, decreasing our dependency on foreign inputs and prioritizing by Ghana um, production. Yeah, to, to boost um, agri productivity, I know um, the youth play a major role in that. Mm -hmm. And though we are making some significant strides in terms of youth involvement in the agri sector, mm -hmm. it looks like it's, so, it's still unattractive to some youth. Mm -hmm. So what, what advice would you give to us as a country to get more youth involved in the agri space? Mm -hmm. Well, I won't give you advice, but I will tell you what WFP is doing okay. because I think that um, 
at some point in time when you give advice, you have to walk the talk. And this is how we're doing that. Most of our uh, food systems program across our pillars, in fact, youth is an integrating um, factor in all of the work that we do in Ghana. We target smallholder farmers that are uh, with a focus on youth is a targeting criteria when we look at farmers and, and also women. When we, um, one of the things that we have adopted as a methodology for operationalizing our country's strategic plan is that we don't want to focus on creating uh, an artificial base of individuals that once the funding runs out, they run out. We go to the market and see how within the agricultural system, how does it work here in Ghana? Um, a key way in which um, farmers get inputs are through the aggregation model. So we target those individuals, we coin them as agro champions, and part of their ability to be to partner with WFP is that they have to demonstrate that they have a network of farmers, youth farmers that work with them. They have to demonstrate that they are empowering them with inputs so that they can become part of the WFP network. And that's key. I know that that's a work, that's a body of work that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture too are targeting. So that in and of itself is how we are promoting um, the, the focus of having food systems on uh, youth. We think that by looking not just at the production of, um, of, of, of food, when we say production, we mean growing, but youth should be involved in the, the transportation, in the marketing, in product development. We want to see what they're doing when these agro champions come to us. We want to see how are you preparing them to get into mechanization. We're looking at the entire system that to make that system attractive to youth, not just to youth farming, but for each youth that we touch, let them see uh, a career aspiration in agriculture, yeah. whether it be farming, whether it be selling, whether it be in transport or warehousing, but to make that process attractive. Thank you. How, how do we build uh, resilience in our food system? looking at the current climate change and economic mm. challenges? Well, I, I think, let me tell you about one of the programs that WFB have is called the Changing Life Transformation Fund. And um, I think there's not a, a just a panacea, one, one stop solution to doing that. I think you have to study the, the context. And in many ways, that transformation fund is a result of lessons learned by WFP in Ghana. Over the years, we receive on an annual basis funding and we target, we go out, we give to smallholder farmers. And then the vision was, well, what if this funding runs out? Yeah. Then what? Um, you, you somehow or another almost walk away feeling that you've left your farmers hanging. What can you do? So we designed a program that will work with farmers to produce um, tree crops. And those tree crops will qualify for carbon offset credits eventually. Their job is to plant it along with what they're doing, uh, whether it be maize, peppers, onions, but continue planting their staple crops and also produce these tree crops so that eventually they would earn also from these tree crops as well as receive carbon offset credits from a commercial lender. That way we are layering in sustainability. We hope that that model can be scaled yeah. um, so that when you go into farming that is a natural business plan that you have your normal crops that you would be planting. Um, you have your tree crops. You're relying on the fact that you are layering in sustainability. So we need to be thinking about those types of ecosystems, 
creating those types of, uh, of ecosystems. And I think that that is key. Do, do you think um, technology plays a major role when it comes to uh, modernization in agri? I think it's everything. I think it's I think it's everything because you you plan your policies around agriculture. You have objectives, but you need to measure whether or not uh, those objectives will be met given the work that you have on the ground. You need to monitor. Um, I'm often bombarded with concerns by aggregators that um, even though this farmer is in their network, they find the same farmers in four or five different network selling the same uh, product or the same production at this, for the same year. So you need to close those gaps that would somehow or another limit uh, private sector from investing in agriculture. Um, when they invest, they want a return. And the way in which they receive a return is to be able to monitor. And you must be able to monitor without putting physical boots on the ground. And I think that's where technology comes in. Technology also can play a key role in soil management, yeah. in, in, in early warning, in anticipatory actions. You need that data. Now, having said that, one of the lessons I've learned is that that data exists. The government is collecting it. Private sector is collecting it. WFP collects it in different forms. I think the only thing that's missing is that we're all not talking to each other and not getting access so that we can, can turn the, the industry on its head and really have get critical information to the farmers as they need it. Um, they need to know what products are out there and what services are out there for them to use. Um, and data can play, data and technology can play a key role in that. Um, the world, as we know it outside of the continent, they, they have achieved that and we need to catch up, not just in Ghana, but um, the continent at large. So how do we catch up? I think we're doing that in the partnerships that we are forging. Right within this year, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has a um, smallholder farmers or farmer platform mm -hmm. that all farmers must be registered on that platform. And not just registered, but also um, their farms must be geomapped. So that when someone speaks and says, okay, we are producing maize, we need to know down to the letter for 2024, the land mass that is being cultivated to produce maize and how much maize, if everything goes well, potentially how many metric tons can be produced in Ghana. Yeah. So that's key. And I think those things are happening, but I, I, I'm, I feel that although they're happening, they're siloed and our jobs as participants in this whole, um, I would call it an adventure because I'm quite excited yeah. about that, in this whole adventure is to talk to each other and just consolidate to harmonize the work that we're doing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, my final question is on how WFP is using technology to drive innovation in the agri mm -hmm. sector. Well, a couple of, oh, so many initiatives, but a couple of things that we are, are doing. One is we are sponsoring a competition of, to, of, to have um, post-harvest loss um, ideas, innovation, I'm, where we don't just want you to tell us I have produced a hermetic bags that keep food longer. We want you to also look at opportunities, look at opportunities whereby, look at opportunities whereby you can transform. I often make the statement, what if all the tomatoes that are grown in Ghana are saved from, from rot or saved from spoilage? What then? Do we have enough Ghanaians to consume all of that, all of those tomatoes within one season? And if not, how can we take tomatoes as we know it and transform it into another, another product? 
the other issue is what's going on in the agricultural space in terms of, of technology. Um, uh, we have um, participated in sending several local companies, one where they were producing moisture meters, or looking at what's going on in the agricultural space where people are actually manufacturing equipment here, how can WFP um, get involved in that and encouraging young people, if not by ourselves, but linking them to others, not just inside Ghana, but outside? How, are, how can you help these people expand um, their production and encourage that type of innovation? But last but not least, WFP has a huge comparative advantage in terms of um, M&E how can we look at um, what we're doing in that space and try to bring um, data together in our analysis, creating dashboards, creating analytics to understand our production. We're very proud of the work that we've done with um, Ghana Commodity Exchange, which is a, a spot market. Mm -hmm. How can the issue of using carbon credits, carbon offset credits, contribute to a Ghana Commodity Exchange, looking at it from a futures market point of view, where if I have a farm that is um, qualified to get carbon offset credits, how can I sell or factor my my future offset credits now to get inputs currently for my farming. Those types of, of innovative ideas we're looking at. Okay, can you elaborate on um, private sector's role in the production of nutritious products? Okay, well, I think they play a huge role and I have a concrete example of, of uh, WFP's work um, there. If you recall, there were several years ago, when I first joined WFP, there was a book that came out. I think the name of, it was either a book or an article, had to do with dead aid, where um, organizations like WFP uh, were cited that while they're doing good in saving lives, most of the food that is purchased in those operations are purchased outside of the country and brought into the country. And um, that was, may save lives, but it also um, may contribute to disincentivizing smallholder farmers or local production. So there, WFP, um, I guess one of the things I'm proud of is that we, we learn lessons and we are quick to layer in those lessons learned in how, what we do uh, to do better in the future. So we started looking at how can we work directly with smallholder farmers to purchase from them. And we're talking about at a, a scale of 100,000 metric tons. We soon learned that to be able to do that on a, on a level of smallholder farmer is too granular. So we, then we started looking at what we do with aggregators. And about five or six years ago, most of WFP's humanitarian operations has a food component, but layered in that food component is a nutrition component where we give something, uh, a product called specialized nutritious food. Um, our focus are on people who are, are malnourished, not severely, but to address almost like a supplement to yeah. address a malnutrition for pregnant and lactating women mm. and children under two. So most of our humanitarian operations have that. So we started looking for um, production companies that could produce that. And again, mo uh, many of those cereal products came from the West. We started looking for local production that could produce those cereals. And in Ghana, we invested in two cereal companies, Premium Food Limited, and yet it. And um, we, it was a catalytic investment. But what that did was signal to banks that if WFP is investing, then maybe we should look at um, these companies mm -hmm. as viable in yeah. terms of providing them with additional resources and inputs. Premium food 
they were we considered both of them as successful. Yedent Food went on to, although they did not become a vendor, a food vendor of WFP, Yedent Food went on to open a multi-user facility where they are producing for other um, production of cereals. I think they call um, tofu or, or soya, mm -hmm. uh, um, vegetarian meats, but they have a huge um, multi-use facility. And then premium food went on to become a vendor, a food, a global food vendor wow. for WFP. I think we have purchased over 15,000 metric tons of food, uh, super cereal from premium for our operations in Burkina Faso, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Cameroon. There's many countries mm -hmm. that have um, humanitarian assistance. But key to this is the number of smallholder farmers within Ghana supplying raw materials to premium. It's over 100,000. And if we were to go out, look for those, it would, we would be hard-pressed yeah. to affect the lives of those smallholder farmers. And it's precisely that model that have fed into how WFP's approach is for um, smallholder farmers, mm. which is still going through the agro champions, that we can reach far more of them if we target um, the aggregators under our MasterCard Foundation project, where we are providing inputs to farmers for post harvest to mitigate the effects of post harvest loss and to increase their income the target will be aggregators, mm. who we are calling agro champions, um, to expand our network. Under that program, we're supposed to reach 100,000 smallholder farmers, which is what we're doing. And the other aspect of that is that looking at all of our programs um, um, within Ghana, recognizing that MasterCard, has it, MasterCard Foundation has its purpose, our changing life transformation has its purpose. We do work for um, um, USAID, yeah. where we have targeted, um, for this year alone, 18,000 smallholder farmers, each with a different purpose. But let's see where are some of, how do we link them across programs to expand the impact of the assistance that's given to any one farmers. We're happy to say, even now, when, when at the beginning I talked about closing gaps, yeah. one of the uh, things that WFP has done in giving assistance to smallholder farmers under the USAID program is to ensure all of those farmers, those 18,000 farmers, are all registered on the government platform. And that's, and, and that's part of what we do to close um, gaps, look at what the government needs and how can we, um, in our little way, contribute to that as well. Yeah. So we're, we're happy with um, those results. Thank That's you. great. Mm -hmm. Ms. Barbara, any mm -hmm. final comments? Well, you know, I'm leaving Ghana um, soon, but you know, I, I often tell this story that when I first got to Ghana, and um, face with the magnitude of now, okay, now you're here, then mm -hmm. what? The only thing that really um, frightened me was not having a vision for how we were going to move our programs forward. But in the partnerships, in the collaborative engagements that we've had with Ghana, the private sector, our other UN agencies, uh, we were able to formulate a, a clear vision and I think Ghana poses an ideal uh, environment for really making meaningful changes. I will close with a, a word of encouragement. Uh, you know, often, and I'm sorry, but the news is off. The news <laughs> all over the world is guilty of of gloom and doom. Yeah. You know, but notwithstanding, there's not a week that goes by in Ghana 
that I don't see young people doing things. They're not waiting for us. Yeah. They're not waiting for the private sector. They're not waiting for government. They're not waiting for academia. They they know they have to get out and they have to hustle. Yeah. And I am I am so optimistic because I feel that they are doing things. The only thing that's missing is that the right hand is not talking to the left hand. We don't know about it. Yeah. But they're doing great. And I feel that great nations and great great people um, make something out of nothing. And yeah. this is what we're seeing. And that's why the youth are so important within this context. But I'd like to you know, end by telling the people of Ghana that I have worked with, thank you and uh, issue a word of encouragement to young people to keep doing what they're doing. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to Ms. Clemens. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, our discussion with Ms. Barbara Clemens, the country director for World Food Program Ghana, has come to an end. And thank you for watching. <laughs>